Some say history is a river that flows endlessly. I say that history is a series of stories written by each person's experiences. Welcome to Stories, a history of Appalachia, one story at a time. Hello, podcast listeners. I'm Steve Gilley, along with my fellow podcaster, Rod Mullins, and we're ready to tell you a couple of stories today. And ironically, the stories Rod and I are getting ready to tell are about the Appalachian tradition of storytelling. Well, oral storytelling in Appalachia comes from the Scots-Irish, influenced by German traditions, and brought over by the first settlers and adapted to the new home. And one of the, um, well, I guess best-known types of those stories are Jack Tales. Now, Jack in the Jack Tales is a typical Cornish or English hero who appears in legends, fairy tales, and nursery rhymes, generally as a young adult. And Jack is often portrayed as lazy or foolish, but through his cleverness and tricks, he usually wins in the end. Well, you've probably grown up with these Jack tales, and Steve, you know which ones we're talking about, even mm-hmm. though you might not realize it. Popular children's stories and nursery rhymes such as Jack and the Beanstalk, Jack Frost, Jack the Giant Killer, Little Jack Horner, oh yes, one of my favorites, and This is the House that Jack Built are all well-known Jack tales. And Jack tales came into prominence during the 30s and 40s when Richard Chase, who was an American folklorist, collected many popular Appalachian Jack tales as told by descendants of Council Harmon in his book, The Jack Tales. Council Harmon's grandfather, Cutliffe Harmon, is thought to very possibly be the one who originally brought the Jack Tales to America. Well, Appalachian Jack Tales are an oral tradition, and like many Appalachian folk songs and stories, they trace their origins back to sources in England and Scotland, where the English original story would feature, say, a king or another noble. The Appalachian Jack Tale version would have a sheriff or a high sheriff. Now, some stories feature Jack's brothers, Will and Tom, Some Jack Tales feature themes that trace to Germanic folk tales. The uh, Harmon, Ward, and Hicks families were known for their storytelling about Jack and other stories. One of those folks, a fellow by the name of Ray Hicks, was probably the best known of those storytellers, and he performed his stories around the country, appearing at the Jonesboro Storytelling Festival, as well as on the PBS series The Story of English and Rod of have you ever been to one of the storytelling festival shows in Jonesboro? No, I haven't. And that's sad, sad thing for me to say. I've always wanted to go and have a chance to go to one of those, but I've been there and I've, I've been around the building down there now, of course, where they have the big dedicated building for the storytelling festival they have in Jonesboro. But I'd really love to go for the International Storytelling Center and the, the festival and the weekend that they have it in October. Right. It's, it's usually held the first full weekend of October. Now, the National Storytelling Festival was founded by Jimmy Neal Smith, a high school journalism teacher in 1973, and it's grown over the years to become probably one of the biggest storytelling festivals, both in the United States and internationally. Now, here's the neat story about how this came about, Rod. In 73, Mr. Smith, who was, as I said, a high school journalism teacher, and a carload of his students just happened to hear Grand Ole Opry regular Jerry Clower. You remember him, don't you? Oh, <laughs> shoot this thing. <laughs> well, they heard Jerry Clower spin a tale over the radio about coon hunting in Mississippi, and I know that story well because I've heard it too. Smith was inspired by that event to create a storytelling festival in Northeast Tennessee. More than 10,000 people come to that festival each year in Tennessee's oldest town, Jonesboro. Lord have mercy, this thing killing me. Shoot this thing. (laughs) (laughs) So now, having said all that, let's get on to a couple of those jack tales, shall we? Let's do it. Okay, this first one is called Sup Doll Sup. Interesting story title. An interesting story, too. And again, as with all these stories, it features a fellow by the name Jack. And in this instance, old Jack was down on his luck and he figured, um, you know, I need some money. So I guess I better go out looking for work. This being before they had welfare, you know, and all that. Well, now Jack didn't like to work much, but he figured it's better than starving. So he put up on his old hat and his head and he set off down the road and kept going till he came up to this old mill. 
Well, the miller was standing outside. Jack asked him if he had any work to give him. Well, yes, I do, said the miller. I need someone to tend the mill and grind the corn. You work for me and I'll pay you fair and give you board and let you sleep in the mill. There's something I should tell you. There's some haunting going on in that mill and nobody who's worked for me has lived past the first night they stayed there. Well, Jack saw that as a challenge. He took a look at the mill. There's a fine big building with plenty of glass windows. It looked really dry and cozy, a lot better than sleeping out in the streets. And he figured, yeah, this would be a good place to set up camp for a while. I reckon I can handle any haunt, said Jack. I don't get scared much and ain't no haunt. It's worse than being dead hungry and out of a job. And so the miller gave Jack the keys to the mill and let him get started. Well, pretty soon after that, an old man with a long beard carrying a big bag of corn over his shoulder walked up the road. Hello, Jack, said the old man. Hello there, said Jack. I don't believe I've ever seen you before. No, said the old man. I'm a stranger. Then how's it you happen to know my name, asked Jack. Well, I knowed you the first time I saw you, said the old man. I was wondering if you could grind this corn for me. Jack took the corn and put it in the mill, ground it up real fine for him. The old man took his bag of meal. He said to Jack, you've been so kind and helpful, Jack. I want to give you a present. Take this here knife made out of silver. It's real sharp. It'll cut real fine. And the old man took off back down the road with his bag of corn meal. Jack busied himself tidying up the mill, put that knife in his pocket as the evening drew on, the miller came up to the door with a big hunk of meat and a big piece of pone for Jack's supper. And you know what pone is, don't you, Rod? I think I do, but uh, go ahead and just refresh my memory just to be on the safe side. Corn pone. Cornbread. Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. I thought so, but I just wanted to make sure. So, <laughs> I reckon any man deserves a fine last meal, the miller said, and set off back to his house. Old Jack built himself a fire. He cooked up that meat into a nice stew, and he settled down for the night. As Jack sat there eating his stew, he just happened to see something out of the corner of his eye, and what did he see but a big black cat that walked right into that room. Well, Jack didn't pay any attention to it, but then another cat came in, and then another. Soon, Rod, there were 12 big old black cats, each one bigger than the last, sitting around the room and staring straight at Jack. Well, now, Jack was uh, had nervous about this, but that's uh, just a bunch of cats. He figured they couldn't do much to him. That is, until the biggest, blackest cat of all walked right up to Jack. It looked him up and down and side to side, and then it spoke to him. Sop, doll, sop, said the cat. And it stuck its paw right in Jack's stew to sop up the juices and started licking that tasty meat right off its paw. Now, as you could imagine, Jack was just a little bit surprised at this. I guess, you know, the cat talking to him and sticking its paw into his stew. But he was a brave man. He looked right back at that cat and he said, you do that again and I'll cut that doll right off. Now, the cat didn't seem to care much. It looked up and down, side to side, all over Jack again. Then it looked right back at that bowl and said, Sop, doll, sop. Well, the cat then stuck its paw back in that bowl again. So Jack whipped out that silver knife the old man had gave him and cut that doll right off. The doll being the paw of the cat. When he did this, that cat let out a yowl and all the other cats started yowling and yowling and screaming and crying and they all ran right out into the night. Well, Jack went to pick up the cat's paw lying on the ground, but when he did, he found that it wasn't a cat's paw at all. It was a woman's hand with a wedding ring on one finger. So Jack wrapped it up in a cloth and set it aside to show the miller in the morning. Well, when the morning came, the miller came right back in without knocking it figuring he'd find nothing but another funeral he'd have to pay for, so to speak. But there was Jack, stretched out before the fire and still snoring away. Well, the miller woke Jack up, and Jack told him what happened and showed him that hand. I know that hand, said the miller, and I sure know that ring. 
you come on up the house with me. We'll get this all sorted out. So Jack and the miller walked up into the house. Miller took him right up to the bedroom to his wife, who was still lying in bed with the covers right up to her chin. You show me your hand, said the miller. Well, his wife stuck out her right hand from under the covers. That ain't the one I want to see. Let me see that left hand, said the miller. But the wife said, nah, she's not going to show him the left hand. So he grabbed those covers, pulled it off, and where her left hand should have been, there was nothing but a bloody stump. Well, now the miller knew that his wife was a witch, and he knew that she was the one who'd killed all the men he'd hired to work for him. Just then, 11 other women rushed into the room. You know, they were the rest of the witches who knew, like witches do, that their secret was out. So Jack and the miller rushed out of the house, barred the door, and set the house on fire. Pretty soon that house, all those witches were burned straight up. It's a lucky thing you had that silver knife, said the miller. You can't hurt a witch with a knife unless it's silver. I guess that wife of mine had been mixed up with a passel of witches. Now they ain't no more of that. So Jack stayed with the miller some time. Paid Jack well, and the miller got himself another, prettier wife who wasn't a witch. Jack made a good living for a time till he reckoned he'd done enough milling, and he's going to set off to find something else to do. Well, that's interesting, Steve. Our first instance of witch crispies going snap, <laughs> crackle, pop. Now, the interesting thing about this story, Rod, is the old man. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the old man represents? No, I don't. So go ahead and tell me. Just go ahead and tell me this. That is where the German influence into these jack tales happen. The old okay. man was Odin. Ah, of okay. Norse mythology, yeah. Right. Okay. And now the, I got it. And you'll see Odin or the old man show up in a lot of these jack tales. Well, well here we go with our next tale. And this is going to be Jack and the Varmints. Now, this tale is partly adapted by Walt Disney and a Mickey Mouse cartoon. So here we go. Now, Jack lived way back up in the mountains with his mother. They got up one morning and they looked in their cupboard for something to eat. And they didn't have anything left. She told Jack, she said, son, you're going to have to find some work so you can buy us something to eat. Well, poor old Jack, he didn't like work. He didn't want to starve to death, though, either. So Jack headed down the road looking for work. Jack found a board aside of the road. They didn't fell off an old wagon. Jack picked up the board, and he got out his knife, and he started whittling on that board into a big old paddle. Well, Jack went down the road till he came to a mud hole, and there was some flies flying around that mud hole. Within a few minutes, and then the flies lit in the mud hole. Jack snuck up in that mud hole with that paddle, and wham! Jack came down with that paddle right in the middle of that mud hole, and Jack picked up the paddle and looked under it, and he killed him seven flies with just one smack. Now, Jack thought he'd done something big. He went on down the road till he come to a blacksmith shop, and then he went in there and he got that man to make him a belt. Jack put that belt on, it read, Big Man Jack killed seven at a whack. Well, Jack went on till he came to the king's house. The king, then he saw Jack's belt. He read it. Big man Jack killed seven at a whack, he said. Jack, you're the man I've been looking for. He said, there's a big line loose. If you can get it for me, I'll give you a thousand dollars. Jack said that, well, for a thousand dollars, I'll give it a try. Well, the king took Jack back in the woods where they had last seen the lion. The king left Jack there, and the king got out of there. If that king that was that scared of that lion, Jack said, I ain't going to mess with it. I'm getting out of here. Jack started home. He came around the bend of the road, and right in the middle of the road sat that big lion. Its mouth open, its teeth are hanging out. It roared so loud, it scared Jack nearly to death. Jack clumb up a big old tree. The lion got under the tree, and with its big old teeth, it cut the tree nearly down. Then the lion got tired and sleepy, and it fell asleep. Jack said, I'm getting out of here. Jack put his foot on a brittly limb. It broke, and 
and Jack fell out of the tree right on top of the lion's back. The lion got up, and it tried to bite Jack. It tried to knock Jack off of its back, but Jack hung on to the lion for dear life. And the lion took off a running. Right into town it went. The king seen that lion a-coming with Jack on its back, and he said, Gosh, what a man Jack is, riding a lion like that. The king grabbed his old rifle, shot that lion, and killed it. He went over to it. Jack was getting up. Jack looked at the king, and he said, I'm mad. I'm good and mad. The king said, well, what are you mad at? He said, I shot the lion. Jack said, that's what I'm mad about, he said. I caught that lion up on the mountain. I was training it for your riding horse. You upped and shot it. That makes me mad. You being the king, you would have looked big riding that lion through town. Well, the king felt sorry for Jack, and then he gave him an extra $1,000. Jack went home with $2,000 in his pocket, and he was tickled to death. (laughs) That is a good story. Yes, it is. And you're a good storyteller, Rod. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. All right. And there are a couple of Jack tales for you from a couple of very amateur storytellers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a part of the history of this place we call home, Appalachia. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, or on your favorite podcast app. We're on Facebook at Stories of Appalachia and on Twitter at Story Appalachia. We also have a website, storiespodcast.net. Again, thanks for listening. Till next time, take care. So long, everybody. <laughs>